Welcome to this week's episode of The Nero Show. In today's episode, I've been drinking the One by Kool-Aid for over a week. What's it been like? What's underrated and what's overrated? Everyone's halfway through their festive 500s, or are they? We propose a few changes. Alex Dowsett starts a coaching company, and we reflect on our chat with Joe from China Cycling. What did we all learn from that one? All right, let's get into it. So, Chris, it has been one week into New Bike Day. Can you give it to me? Tell me how it is. I'm very curious. Now, you know what you're not allowed to say, <laughs> so here's the challenge. Explain how the new bike's going without those classic one-liners. I'm very curious. I've been dreading this because how do, how do bike reviewers do this? Like, seriously, I, I've had suggestions from people on, like, what terminology I can use. Yeah. Uh, it's just been, yeah, it's been quite stressful to think about this. Why don't, I, why don't I help you out, okay? Let's start off with the objective. So we did discuss the weight of it and what we thought would be fair. What's this thing come in at weight-wise? Yeah, so good question. With that thumbnail we did last week, that was, that was accurate to the point of what we were talking about. So without pedals, without bottle cages and that kind of stuff. So built up with pedals, with bottle cages, with a really crappy computer mount, which I'll get into, uh, 7.5. 7 kilos. That is very respectable. Mm. I think we can all say. It does have one buy, but I could that's that's really competitive. I can I can say that that blew me away. It didn't seem to surprise uh the guys at the bike shop as much, which I thought was interesting, and I think you you mentioned the one buy thing. That is especially on the SRAM side of side of the equation, definitely a big a big weight saving thing. That front derailleur in the SRAM world, with its battery and all its mechanics, is a bit of a chunker. It's a bit of a clunk. Mm. So, what was in my brain and my mind, and a lot of the discussions that I had with other S five users, <laughs> is our two by runners and. That's where I kind of was thinking the 7.8 in that sort mm. of that sort of ballpark. Because I chatted to Edwin about this too, and he was whole going on about how good it is and run by with SRAM because of the battery thing. Because on SRAM, you've got the battery on the rear derailleur, battery on the front derailleur. So if you take the front derailleur off, you're losing half your battery. On Shimano, where the battery is totally separate, sits in the seat tube most of the time, if you lose the front derailleur, you don't also lose part of the battery. So I did go and I did some research, everyone. You'll be happy to know. So take the front derailleur off on its own. It saves about 145 grams. The battery is another about 25 grams. So put those two together plus the chain ring. The chain ring saves about 45 grams too. So put that together. You're in about 200 gram territory if you're running SRAM to go one by which might not sound like a lot. And you always say this and there's people that go, oh, it's just 200 grams. You're not going to notice that speed rise up a climb, blah, blah, blah. But how many times at the cafe have you heard you ask someone, I got a Marita Reacto, let's say. What's it like? Oh, it's a good bike, you know. I really like it. Wish I could. It's good at speed. But... It's about eight kilos. It's, it's that I've heard that so many times. So going to one buy, taking off 200 grams, suddenly instead of 7.98, you're 7.7, 7.6. And when you're spending 10 plus grand on a bike, going, being able to remove that, oh, but it's about eight kilos makes a difference in terms of how you're perceiving the bike. So... I think, um, look, it's, it's, it's obviously not that heavy a frame and, and all the things like that to get it like that, but I do think, yeah, going the one by, as you said, it's the, the new ceramic speed, that's where it's making the difference in the, the chat at the cafe. Almost tempted to do like this overrate, overrated and underrated thing when it comes to talking points from one by setups or even just this change in general because so the first thing I heard, well, the first, first chat was, oh, you're really going to notice the shift increase. You're really going to notice it in terms of going from Shimano Di2, 12-speed, cream of the crop, best thing that's ever been invented, dogs, bollocks, all the rest of it, 
to this SRAM stuff, you're really going to notice the change. You're going to hit the hit the button, wait 20 minutes, and then finally it'll shift. Massively overrated in terms of an issue. Now, there is a potential here. I've I've had a few DMs from people who, yeah, will remain nameless. I like where this is going. Okay. Who have suggested that the one by setup on a SRAM group set speeds up the rear derailleur shift. Like we're talking, we're talking a little bit, but there's, there is a thing in it. Okay. Because it's not, the system isn't waiting. There's, there's less of a delay because it's not waiting for the, the antics of, is this going to be a front derailleur shift? The rear derailleur, the, the shifters know that this is a rear derailleur shift no matter what. Because so it the, doesn't have the double press. Correct. It's not waiting to see if you press the other Correct. one. Okay. Yeah. The delay okay. is less. Right. Now, I, 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 I haven't okay. <laughs> tested this, but I will definitely say I've had a very, very, very limited experience riding SRAM road in the past. And when I moved to, to Shimano 12 speed a couple of 18 months ago, I was initially surprised with just how snappy the shifting was. Coming back to SRAM now, onto the one by setup, I was less whoa, blown mm-hmm. away by that. So potentially that's a thing. Does it know you're running one by though? Does the rear derailleur know there's not a front derailleur? Or is, well, who sends the signal? Does the shifters know there's not a front derailleur? Is it like in the app? Is that a conf- would no. it, is it Does it detect it? No, it's not, it, configured, so how- it's not configured yeah. one by in the app. Please okay. correct me down mm. below. If that isn't the case. Because how would it be able to speed up the shifting unless it knew, unless you had told it there's no front derailleur so that it's not waiting for that second paddle to come in? You know what I mean? That's a potential hole in my argument. What YouTuber would you pick to run this test? Because there's a couple of things in my head here. It's, it's, it's going, okay, if I just go one by and don't change any of the settings, can the system detect it and speed the shifting up? Does that happen? Yes or no? And then if, so if it's no... Is there a is there a way to turn to, to configure it as one by, and then does it speed up the shifting, or does it not speed up the shifting at all, no matter what you do, unless you have this supposed special source Yumbo firmware that, that speeds it up? Who would you pick? Who's who's the guy for this? Do you think? Okay, so I'm really glad you asked that question because I did a little bit of digging before I made this shift shift, and there was a guy a guy in the US is. It's not a big channel. I think it's John Maloney Cycling, and he's got this whole series where he's got this rig jigged up with SRAM Red versus Shimano, and he's he's doing full, like, split timing tests of the shifts and all that kind of stuff. Now, I've, he's got two or three of these. Um, I've seen him do them. He's done, like, full slow motion versus it where he's got, like, 400 frames a second broken down. I'll, I'll put the links down below, <laughs> but they're great. They're just proper in your garage shift tests. Yep. John, we need to get someone needs to get that man a one by setup and, and do some do some testing Fact for us. Checking. I can hundred I can hundred percent see why that would speed up the shifting. Definitely, it's just whether that is occurring or not. I'd be curious to know. Underrated, underrated when it comes to this move was the feeling of the hoods. There is So the size of those SRAM red hoods, uh, I, they, they really do affect your position. At least I find they do. They're bigger. They're essentially probably like five mil more reach at least on them. The, the way that you position your hands on them is, is slightly different. And it's not, it wasn't for me just a simple case of, taking my position from one bike to the other, those hoods did make a difference. The reach adjustment's pretty good on them, so I've made, I've made that change. But that, if I was to just purely say, like, how it affected the brake modulation and all that kind of stuff, I do think the Shimano stuff probably holds a little bit of sway in that. And I didn't hear that. That's well, The reason I say underrated is I didn't hear that chat too much, like, oh, you're really going to notice the hoods. So how do you find the the ride of the bike? Uh, much of muchness, better, slower. What's what's the what's the vibe? Now you've ridden it in Centennial. You've ridden it to Larpa. You've done a a Brooklyn bobbin head kind of hilly loop with some eight minute climbs ish. Pretty similar. 
pretty similar in terms of in terms of the the actual ride quality of the bike. Yeah, it yeah. it's pretty similar. If if you actually blindfolded me on the first ride. And it, it's, it's like humans are shit at this. Like we're so bad at this. Those first couple of rides you get, it doesn't matter what, it could have been an AliExpress bike at this point. You get on the thing and you're just like, whoa, oh, 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 <laughs> new bike, whoa. You're like everyone's going to be dropping everyone now. It's so, uh, yeah, if you'd blindfold me that first day, I would have just been, I would have come in here and gone, oh, my lads, I tell you what, <laughs> it's all done. It's Miller, Miller first, second, third for the rest of the year. But um yeah, look, it's taken me – I talked about that reach thing. It's taken me a good week. Today was the first day the bike started to feel like mine, if that makes sense. Yep. Like I was actually starting to sort of throw it around a bit. And it's – this isn't – I don't know. This is not specific to this bike, but it's ridiculous. Like I just rode a 200-watt – endurance ride around Sydney, which is kind of hilly and bumpy and things, and it's like 32 kilometres an hour average speed. It's a joke. It's an absolute joke what you can do on these things. Can I give two irrelevant Strava segments? No, I won't. Can I say no? Yeah. Because they're irrelevant Strava segments. If you say the times, you're making them relevant. So you you can't then say, I saw saw the Instagram story you did, Mm -hmm. and I was like, why did you do that, Chris? You've you've put it in there. This is irrelevant because of X number of different variables, but then you've put it up anyway, and you've made the irrelevant relevant. My 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 rationale for calling it being able to call it irrelevant was because I was going to back up that time with okay, so that was a faster climb, quote unquote, over the air road, right? And so you would say, oh, ooh, ooh, that's interesting. S five was faster on the climb. Oh, not sure about that. That's not what I heard would be, would be the case. But the other one that I was going to use was I did my 40 minutes, 300 watts, Centennial Park, pure just flatline aero speed, and it was half a kilometre an hour slower than the aero over that particular thing on completely different days, completely different <laughs> conditions. <laughs> but, yes, here we but are. But, yeah, you're in the Strava app digging yeah. through it. Digging through. <laughs> and posting it Absolutely. anyway. Absolutely. Yep. Well, how come the follow up? Where where'd the follow up story go? Well, that, that was, was this was the follow up. Oh, the follow up was tune oh. in today, and oh. I will I will tell you that this is <laughs> okay. going to be irrelevant. All right. I will. Can and I? For those just, on Instagram think is this thing's an absolute spaceship unless they've come on and. <laughs> can I just come back to the one by thing real quick? Sure. So I did make the mistake last week. I said eleven thirty three. It's of course it's a ten thirty three. <laughs> Oops. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's a 52 front chain ring. For riding around Sydney, you would not want anything less than that under any circumstances. Like that's that's pushing the limits of it. I think I had this chat to you during the week where I was saying there's a few kind of known like slopes around here. And if you're trying to do like an endurance ride or something like that, it's borderline impossible with, with that gearing. So there's like a... a uh, a slope on the way up uh, Wakehurst Parkway, which is probably about seven percent. I got to do pretty much three hundred and something watts to get up that in the in the thirty three. Oh, don't get me wrong; like no one should be running one by in Sydney. I mean, pretty much the only reason would be so that you can Gee, say your bike's two hundred gram lighter at the cafe. In every other way, it's more annoying. No, I disagree. Okay, increased chance of dropping your chain. Not yet proved. Go on. Okay, well, uh, Primoz at the tour. Mm, okay. Every pretty much every other chain drop I see is one by. No, now there's different. Is, they is, run those aftermarket chain ring things. All right. Okay. I'm 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 waiting for my first chain drop, and I will. Okay. I'll post a picture does, of it. Does the shrimp? It's not a clutch reader either, is it? It's just no. a regular road one. Yep. Have yep. you got a chain keeper on it? No. No. Those. You cannot tell me that your chance of dropping a chain is not is the same or less than if you had a front derailleur on. Oh, it's definitely more. Okay. Yes. Okay. But, well, yeah. But, okay. That's no, what actually, I was saying. No, I'm, I'm not sure that is the case. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm not shifting it. And so the, the likelihood of me dropping the chain during the shift is zero now. So that's, that's rational. That's a thing. 
the with a properly set up front derailleur, the chain doesn't drop from shifting. Every single person <laughs> listening to this show has had their chain drop from shifting. It's just well, it improperly set up. Yeah, but that's not. We don't live in that world. We live in a world where we just park okay, our bike well, in the I've garage. I've raced my bike a lot, and pretty much every drop, dropped chain I see is someone running one by. I don't disagree with that. I think in a, in a race circumstance, specifically like a crit circumstance, yes, you're dead right. The chances are probably higher because no one is shifting their front their front derailleur in a in a criterion. I I'll give you that. But on a day to day circumstance, no, I, I don't think in that's a way the that case. can be mitigated. I admit, like yeah, if you don't set your front derailleur up properly and you drop your chain, can set up your front derailleur properly so it doesn't drop the chain. Yes. In a way that you can't mitigate with one by that natural inclination for the chain to come off, which I may be totally making up, and maybe God is just pulling people's one by chains off when I when I'm right past them. I don't know. Uh, oh, I've been okay. the first person to laugh at one by riders on the side of the side of the <laughs> track in a in a crit, saying, "Well, look at you, you stupid yeah. idiot!" <laughs> like, don't get me wrong, <laughs> I've been that person. And I potentially will uh, be at some point, yeah. but yeah. Okay. Um, there's a, um, where were we? we were going through set of pros. Because uh, can I just quickly say, yeah. keeping this thing clean, oh my god, okay. amazingly easy. That you don't realise removing all that sh- stuff from the front derailleur, how nice and easy it is. Like I got yeah. stuck in just a proper slop fest mm-hmm. in Centennial Park the other day on this, and it was a very easy. She was a hose down and towel off pretty much at this point. Like very, very good. Mm-hmm. So that's that's a thing. That's that's a little nudge in the practicality but element for me. Try not to comment um, well, on the hose cl- down and towel off. Okay. Um, so <laughs> moving on. So you've got just just in just to not shill one by, you gotta write you go up a hill, you gotta write a massive gear because you don't have a front, <laughs> you don't have an inner ring. You got <laughs> Arguably an increased chance of your chain coming off, but your bike's 200 grams lighter. Yep. I mean, I'm taking the double chain. <laughs> any day. Oh, but it's easy to clean. Easy to clean. Yeah. <laughs> easy and to it, clean and it sounds cool at the cafe. And I'm going to wear my knee cartilages out pretty quickly because yeah. I'll be right. And it looks foot. cooler. And it looks cooler. Take yeah. your pick. Take your pick. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, it is, it's funny riding it. I, I will admit in terms of like, so I, and I'll probably get used to this, mm-hmm. but I've found myself thinking a lot about I even put it up on my Garmin, like where I am on the cassette to give me give me a bit of an idea about where I am. Um, you kind of think a little bit more about your cadence. I'm not sure that's a good thing or a bad thing, because it was I found it really easy for the first couple of rides to just start to grind. And you you, you just grind you do like just it's almost like the death spiral on erg mode. You were kind of just lazily not thinking about it. And next minute you're doing 66 cadence and you're like, hang on, what, what's happened here? Mm. And you sort of think about it and you pop it down a few. So there's definitely, you definitely are more engaged. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing with actually where you are on the, on the cassette because mm. you need to be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Did you, do you set up the, the Hubbard, Indicator on the head it, unit yeah. with the gear in. I've 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 got it on one of my screens now. Yeah, okay, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But the other the other useful in thing case is you can't look down. Check. The other yeah. useful thing on the Garmin is it gives you an alert when you're in the extremes on either end. Okay. And that's the other thing. It's kind of weird to start. Hold on. Getting, it, it, what? It gives you an alert. Yeah, it gives you. A, you'll get a beep if you're in the ten or the thirty three. Once you shift into that that um, gear, it will give you a what, little. What beep. beeps? The head unit or the shifters? The head unit. Head unit beeps. Mm-hmm. Oh my god! Try and catch okay. up. I just this I'm is just... modern day cycling, Jesse. <laughs> oh Jesus. Oh, Where are you? That's just... very. This is that's cool. That's very. I. I. That's a great feature. <laughs> I really love that. That's not a SRAM thing, by the way. That's on every group. Oh, set. is it? You can set okay. it up to do oh. that. Yeah. Okay. What is? How is that useful? In case you accidentally press the button one more time and the you chain just know you're there. Way. All right. In the thirty-three. All right, okay. in the 10. Hmm. Good yep. to know. Nice to know. Yep. Okay. Okay. Now, so what's going on with this head unit mount thing you're going on about? No good? Oh, so that was that's just like a general rant because 
in the last few years, the like the essentially the super bikes that I've had a chance to ride, the proprietary bike computer head units that come with these things are absolute slop. The Canyon one was like this piece of plastic that sort of shoved your garment at like <laughs> yeah. a 90 degree yeah. level. And you're like, what? We've just spent multi-million yeah. dollars worth of research and development and we're slapping our garments at like a 45 degree level. Like what is happening? Yeah. And the, the, I remember that. You came yeah. in, I was laughing at you. came to the park and the Garmin's like that. Oh, you, you, like, what is going on? You, pro- you properly yeah. bike shamed me on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, and then the Cervelo one, it's it's kind of not much better. It's 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 over engineered. It's like this weird two part system where you sort of attach one part and it backs onto the other part. Ultimately it just has all these fail points. So there's lots of there's lots of um, hinges on it. So if not if all the hinges aren't screwed to the right torque setting. Of course, what ends up happening is the computer starts coming loose anyway. And me with the the 1040, it's already kind of in the heavy, big, bigger side of it. Mm. So I've already had two situations where I basically had to ha- take the head unit off, put it in my back pocket because the bloody mounting oh. system's bobbling away. So I don't know. I, it's just that's, that's so just annoying. a general. Yeah. It's like inner soles with seven hundred dollar shoes. They're always trash. Bike computer mounts on. $20,000 bikes for some reason are trash. So aftermarket one, I'll put a link down to a guy in WA who does one. He's a good man, so he's going to send me one to use, so I'll get on board with There's him. another guy, head unit mount guy. Head mount guy. Your 3D yep. printing guy. Well, he's he's also my Varia, my Varia uh, seat post proprietary printing man. He does them for all specific bikes. So like the, the Factor had one and he mounts, it's like a proper – sits perfectly with the oh, proprietary nice. seat post. Yeah, good solution. Mm. Like that. I think he rode Puppers. <laughs> no mention of it. Shout, shout to Puppers. Well done. You got around for another year. That's a nod to the negative when it comes to practicality. I will say the seat po- the saddle solution they've got is one of the better ones I've seen for aero bikes. So it's just a one of those nice little bezel ones so you can set the level on it, set the location of it, and then tighten the bezel using your fingers before tightening it, tightening it up. I don't know about you, but I've had plenty of situations with aero bikes or any kind of high-end bike where the actual positioning of your saddle and getting the level is like some encyclopedia balance between the two torque settings of the two bolts. The one of my TCRs like that. You're like, you got to do it. Yeah, yeah. This just was like set the level, set the location, tighten them up, we're done. Yeah. It was really good actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know it's weird like little practical things. Little like things that, that make ones. a difference. Like it's just one one of those like, – yeah, one of those little things is annoying. I mean with this saddle, you know, maybe not because you're not adjusting it that much, but it stuff all adds up. What do you want to know about it? Like is there an ultimate test or an ultimate bit of feedback I can give you? Because I'm only here to, to make you happy, Jesse, all right? I'm <laughs> – I'm I'm terrified of you at this point. <laughs> like you've threatened to walk out if I mention a <laughs> phrase. So I'm 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 very conscious of this. So I'm not sure whether you want like scientific, re- like really detailed stuff, or you just want vibe. Because I can sit here and talk vibe all day. While you're thinking, if anyone's got an idea for a top tube bag. On this S5, please help me out because my current top tube bag doesn't work and I thought maybe there's like a proprietary one that works in the little bum crack. I don't know. That would be really useful if there is one of those. Um, but, yeah, my current top tube bag doesn't work. So vibe. Vibe's on hold. And I'll also add that the maximum tyre clearance is 32 mil. Thank you to the 300 people who DM'd me after that. And I will be mounting 30 mils. In the words of Joe from China Cycling, great question. Good question. It was really nice having yeah, that interview. Was. And every good. time you ask, he goes, yeah. good question. I yeah. went, oh, was it really? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can start doing that now. Yeah. Uh, so great question. Uh, the answer I really want is in comparison to the other bikes you've rode, I mm-hmm. don't want high in the sky vibe calls about speed because I could just go look up testing data i want to hear how it rides compared to yeah the previous bikes you've ridden so your canyon air road chapter two and
And also, if you can try and remember back to your old your rim brake bikes, mm-hmm. that's what I want from you. Yeah. As it relates to that, I'm happy. At what specific things as it relates to that, fair game. It feels faster. Cool. Sure. It feels lighter. It's a better ride, smoother ride. Handles better, twitchier. Go for gold. But compared to X, not okay. compared to whatever make-believe stat. Yep. I just think that's important because, especially from reviewers, that's really the only, that's really the only uh, kind of opinion they have that's based in anything. Is I used to ride this bike, now I ride this bike, and it feels X. And you can't, unless they're lying, you can't really argue with that. And so if you can go to 10 different YouTubers and hear how X bike compares to ABC other bikes and then do that across your your 10 favorite YouTubers, well, you you can then start to get a pretty good idea of how the bike's going to go. And if, as I said, if everyone is just comparing this to some idealistic image of how a bike should ride and feel, you don't, you have no comparison points. So I'd love to really, yeah, get you dialed into that. That's where I think Cam Nichols is good in that he generally refers to bikes from what I've seen in reference to other bikes he's ridden. He's not mm. off with the fairies and that's why it helps because you can then make better comparisons. I do hate the fact that I put those Strava or that Strava segment up, right? But so the almost... The, not the reason I did, but the reason I started going down that rabbit hole was because when I rode that climb, it felt slow. And I was like, I was doing the, oh, shit, I'm a bit worried about this. Like, that's that's a – and then I see the time. I'm like, shit, it's like the fastest time I've done it there in two years. Well, what do you – that's what I mean. What do you mean it feels slow? And I put a bit more power out. I would prefer to fe- have felt the bike move faster. It's so it's not simply as simply that. Okay, yeah. So th- perhaps if you were more specific, would you say it's not as twitchy? It's not as stiff, even. Well, I could, I could, I could go into the rabbit hole of it's not as reactive. Okay, but then the problem with that was when I was doing. But then, but then compared to, it's not as, insert adjective, mm. compared to the air road. Mm. You don't, don't know. You don't like it? Don't like that? I don't, I, no, because the first, so the, the first ride that I did on the bike, uh, Dan gave me a set of like 30 20s. Or no, it was 30 30s actually. And so that's essentially a reactive feeling, like hmm? vibe. Right, and I I did that session. I was like, "Holy crap! This is nothing like all the warnings people were giving me about. Oh, it's slow to get started. Blah 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 blah." I felt like snap. I was moving. Okay, and I loved it. But that's that, that's important. Mm. That's better than. So, in, from my point of view, that's better than the bike was thirty seconds faster up Bob and Head okay. in false conditions. Right, like I'd I, rather I, you're totally. Potentially incorrect but subjective feeling compared to fewer data, which is just junk because of the, all the c- other considerations. Because mm. you're kind of in your head, you're waiting that more because mm. it's faster, but it's potentially totally wrong. Mm. Whereas it felt slow. Yeah, it felt slow. Mm. I mean, do you want to ride a bike that feels slow? I don't. Mm. Now, yeah. you could then compare more objective things to see what the actual speed would be. But how that feels is still important in buying a bike. I want to ride a bike that feels fast. Now, I also want to ride a bike that is fast. But how can it, you know how what I mean? It, like, but how can a bike that felt snappy and reactive when I'm doing short, more intense power profile mm-hmm. things, how can that bike feel slower to get started? At, at a, know, at a yeah. lower, do you know what I mean? So, so that, this is where I'm in a... But that's on you. So that's the skill of the reviewer mm, yeah. is to write it in all those different sessions and different terrains and try and sort through some of that noise, I guess, and mm. really give a true feeling of how the bike feels. Like I, I, I would actually say that's on you to... to 100%. To, to kind of cut through. 100%. But it doesn't mean it's not worth... Yeah, it's, it, that doesn't mean it's, that's less valuable than... A random climb up a 
pretty much random condition mm. segment. Yeah. But that's also me because I would just never buy a bike because someone on YouTube said it went 30 seconds quicker up a random segment. But I, I'm, I would be influenced in my purchasing decisions to buy a bike because someone said the ride felt really smooth and it was a great bike to ride and they loved the way it handled. Like that would impact how I purchase. So I guess it's, it's also individual depending mm. on what someone – Inf what information someone wants to absorb when they're looking at it. So much. I mean, that's the kind of little nuances of the performance thing. What really interests me, this is, this is a high-end super bike, and I've essentially got it slammed at the moment, and I'm suffering no body aches and pains and things like that. That, to me, is something. And, again, that was – I remember – I remember who warned me on that it was like, Oh, you're going to, you're going to feel beaten up with this bike. And I'm almost waiting for it, you know? And again, maybe that's just time and that, that sort of thing, but that's been, and, and that's a, that's a factor. That's an interesting thing to me that I'm, I'm able to ride in a position like that and not be suffering what I would have thought would be the consequences of that. Yep. You know, I mean, I know that can... Yeah, but then as a good reviewer, that comes on you to then be like, okay, well, is the is the position similar to what it was on the air road? Is it... You're trying, like, in your due diligence is to try and remove all of the other potential factors to make sure that what you're feeling is from, yeah, from that. Sounds like, you know, you're pure, you've ridden a lot. You know what the... You've ridden for so, so much. You know if the bike's in a different position. All right, guys, you, are you with Jesse? Do you want to see specific ride style rhetoric around this or are you more interested in the, the data side of it? How's your Festive 500 going, JC? Oh, uh, not good. It went downhill quick because I missed the first day. You it's were talking a big game coming into this. I was. You were talking. Come on. Well, I missed the Christmas Eve ride. I didn't have time. Mm. And then you're behind the eight ball. Then it's Christmas Day. If you're... You ride on Christmas Day. Oh fuck! I got pissed. Off. I, I don't like. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you, part of me thinks it's really sad to ride on Christmas Day because it's a it's a family day. You just you should be with your friends and family, loving life. You can ride every other day of the year, but. In defense of everyone that rides on Christmas Day, maybe if you don't have the big family thing to do and to go to, it's nice to get out and enjoy the quiet roads. As someone who rode on Christmas Day for the first time in a long, long time, I felt very self-conscious about <laughs> it because I was with you. <laughs> I am... I am. I would see the uploads on Christmas Day and I'm a bit like, how dare you? How dare you ruin our agreement <laughs> that that is just a, a day for, as you said, family and, and that kind of thing. But beyond that, beyond that, right, again, as someone who rode on Christmas Day, I think it's against the spirit of the festive 500 to ride on that day. It's, it's, an, it's, it's, like, it's like the rest day at the test match, not that that means anything to you, but it's, it's off limits. And I firmly believe that your kilometres that you, you secure – on that day, don't either don't count or should be minus off your off your oh, off minus your ultimate off. Total, okay off your ultimate total. <laughs> I don't like it. Now, I enjoyed my ride. Mm -hmm. Circumstances of us being up with Santa at when we were meant by nine a.m. There was there was a couple of hours, so the circumstances allowed for it. And yes, there's no traffic on the roads. I rode roads that I never get to ride on, so that was cool. But yes, self conscious about it. For that reason, I think the Festive 500 should move. Go Jan 1st to Jan 8th. Because, go, go there is, because having the Festive 500 on over Christmas, you get the guilt. Because then Christmas Day, I'm going, well, I sh it's Christmas. I should not be riding my bike, but I'm losing ground to the Festive to Miller, 500. Who's out there. It's a sad loser Miller out on Christmas Day. <laughs> and every other loser is out riding on Christmas Day. And then you behind, and then so it's not it's not a nice feeling. So if if it was, and the other thing is, if you do your big festive five hundred, 
and then you cooked for the first couple days of the year, okay, you feel good, your festive 500's done, but then you're kind of behind the eight ball on the, the January tally because that's a big thing. It's kind of get up and it's Jan 1st, you knock out 100K yeah. and you're up, you're up ahead. But if you're tired because you've been cranking the kilometres. You are totally out of touch. Coil out of touch. Here we go. All right. It's all about cooking yourself. It's all about creeping your way to New Year's Eve, absolutely flogged, not wanting to see a bike ever again. That's that's the whole ethos of, of the thing. What? Now, the, the other part of this is a lot of – it's a time-off thing. The, the, the majority of people get that time between boxing for between Christmas Eve – and New Year's Eve oh, as time here he off. Comes so on. you're going to go with that route. Rolls so, in on his high horse. We have jobs, you know. It's all well and good. It's, but it yeah. becomes where I do agree with you. That maybe I do agree with you. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm okay. talking out loud here. Okay. Because the actual location of the Festive 500 becomes this logistic challenge of balancing the riding with family stuff, probably. Mm. So it's 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 going to be impacting potentially on the one part of the year, which you do, you would have got to spend a hundred percent of the time with the family. Damn. It's what I don't like. <laughs> it's, and if you, if you probably exercise addicted, like I am, it plays on the back of your brain. It's in there. And cause you're probably eating more food than you usually would. And you're like, Oh, it'd be good to go out and burn some calories and stay active. And then that's the whole toxic, you know, road cyclist thing. Um, whereas if it's the festive no, it wouldn't be called the, it'd be like the New Year 500. Just hit January and just start cranking it Jan 1st. And because we're cyclists, we, we don't really do anything. Fu- no one's out, you know, pumping New Year's Eve, it, uh, really. So so is it, is it doesn't it, matter. Is it what's more disrespectful, to ride on New Year's Day or Christmas Day? Oh, right oh. on New Year's Day is, 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 a, is like everyone should be out there riding New Year's Day. Most... <laughs> Most road cyclists, you know, probably not going to be drinking too much, probably won't be staying up to 3 a.m. So get out January 1st and get into it. Whereas Christmas Day, <laughs> it's just, it's not on. So that's why I'd like to, I'm, 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 I'm just moving, I will, I'm not going to do it, but I would potentially just move my 500 to the first week of the year. I like it. There's, there's, there's room around it. We could, we could brand it as a, I mean, we've said this before, like, that the actual concept, this is slight, this is all tongue in cheek, I might add. Like the actual concept of the Festive 500 has to be the most inclusive, best social media slash influencer ambassador y thing in cycling. Yep. Full stop. It is, it, like, I look forward. This is probably going to be the first year I haven't done it in like a really long time. I look forward to the Festive 500. During the Festive 500, if I'm doing it, I will often. Put that on Strava, like you're kind of naming it Festive 500 uh, yes. Day One. Yep. You put your screenshots of the Rafa thing with like the how many Ks you did. As a coach, quite often that'll be part of the training I prescribe. Literally, like I, I'm if if it's appropriate for that person, maybe they don't have any big events coming up. It's a part of their preseason training is just do the Festive 500. Like you'll try and fit that in. So I I, I it, it's um I'm a I'm all for it. It just with me now it's it's not fitting. So I've soured. One of the like the joys of it that I find, and you, you'll hear it pretty often. So we live in Sydney, metropolitan, busy, busy city. The traffic at this time of year is is less. Okay, oh so good. It's it's really it's really good. And what that means in reality, so for it means so basically to to do a lot of the the longer rides for us, we would normally have to leave very early. So you would be probably meeting at 6, 6.30, that kind of thing, to get in a group to ride out of town to go and do these things. Where at this time of year, you can legitimately leave at 9, mm-hmm. 9.30 and get magic carpet runs mm-hmm. up some of these main main passes and main roads to, to do that. So there's, I suppose that's a long way of me saying, like the, the freedom that that allows me personally makes this a really enjoyable time to ride, and I will probably do this just for that particular reason. Did you get any? Uh, do you still get Christmas presents? What's the deal? Yeah, yeah. 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 Anything yeah. cycling related? 
Uh, well, Joe sent me. Joe sent me a panda podium hat. Oh, yeah, and you got a panda behind you there. Are yeah. oh, you going to put it on? Yeah. Oh, hold on. Is this? Isn't this like really racist? No, just a racist. It's a panda hat. What? <laughs> What's wrong with a panda hat? I bet you if you came on with like some <laughs> Russian hat thing. <laughs> All right, panda podium support. <laughs> panda podium. <laughs> got panda podium socks. <laughs> uh, thank you, Joe. Appreciate that. Uh, what was the word for the uh, your bikes, like, your, your, your layups shit? What's that? A, oh, uh, oh. <laughs> uh, chow moi. Chien moi. <laughs> moi. <laughs> Put your hat, go do that. Do oh, come on. <laughs> come on. You said it wasn't racist. No. Put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> it looks like a duck and it quacks <laughs> like a duck. It's probably a duck. Chien <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, dear. Yeah, it well, that was <laughs> Is that going to make the edit? <laughs> That's fucked. <laughs> Did you get any cycling presents? Oh, sorry. Um, I d well, no, I was a bit light on presents this year, but I did get um, – I have a new set of wheels that I'm testing for a brand. So that was kind of fun. That came a couple of days before Christmas. Um, and it is I, – I don't usually get new gear, like cycling gear. I'm not that into it. But I can't deny just a new piece of something. Hmm. It, it's, it's like, okay, I'm going on the road bike instead of my usual. He's getting on the gravel bike again. He's so he can do his own too. It's, I was purposefully getting out on the road bike because I had a new set of wheels. It was really nice. Enjoyed it. Speaking of the chat with Joe. Yep. What's the, have you got any takeaways this time? Six months, six months on. Uh, I've got, ta my takeaway is I've, I've fully cooled on this Chinese direct from mm. no, not from direct from China. They're all any of the direct from Asia stuff because the wheels is it's 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 saturated. It's kind of done. It's still yeah, it's still good deals, but it's not exciting. You're getting you know the wheels is sort of cool. Uh, you still can't buy a complete bike, so you can buy frames, and you got to go through all the headache of building them up until they're doing really good group sets, or you can buy complete bikes. I'm just. I'm not that – doesn't have the same spark it did probably two years ago where it was really exciting. I thought, I thought it was – I mean, we asked obviously that question. If you haven't seen that video, go and have a look at it. It's, I, I personally actually think it's, a, it's more interesting than the first time we had him on. I, I, I think the chat that he was talking about with some of the counterfeit frames, the molding stuff, like that to me I learnt a heap about that. Mm. I did – I thought – was interesting what he was saying about the the mentality about these Chinese brands, and obviously got they've got their domestic market, and that sort of is is a thing that they're they're thinking about. But it's a very different way of thinking for these brands because it's not like I get the sense right. It's not like Sensor or L two. Their their end goal is to be the next Shram or be the next Shimano. I thought he was inferring that it's that they get bought by one of them or sort of morph into something that becomes the third one. Mm. It's like and that was that was the moment I was like, "Oh yeah, this is this is a decade away." You could see it play out too cuz yeah. I I'm pretty sure we had this we might have had this discussion or we had it off on the phone call one day cuz we were talking about um Canyon and how um or giant even, and you buy your giant helmet and your shoes and the bike, and it's kind of, what's next? Well, if giant just buy a group set 100%. license, and then suddenly you're buying a TCR with the group set and they get the whole everything, it's um, that's where the prices could really come down. If Canyon get in there and then suddenly you're buying Canyon Aeroad with a Canyon Power Meter with a Canyon group set, Oh, if it works well, that's going to be a game changer. 100%. And then you, you bring in all their distribution, you bring in their research and development, you bring in their factories. I totally I totally see that being the the way potentially, but I mean when I when I when he said that and I started thinking about that, my gut thing was, oh, it's a decade. Like I that that yeah. thing of here we are we're on the cusp kind of left me at that moment. Like, yeah. So that was my biggest takeaway from it. Again, I really enjoyed it. Um, 
super interesting chat uh, with Joe. Uh, best wishes to to him and and the Panda team. So I think he was also on with Peak. He's been busy, man. He's on with Peak Talk. Peak Talk. Doing the fat. Yep. Um, they talked about us, by the way. Oh, we got a shout out. We got a shout out. Very very positive, seemingly. Sadly, I don't know. Um, and also, Hambini gave us a shout out. It's kind of super cool. Oh, we got like his in his version of some awards. He's yeah. up and coming, or it's doing good. Yeah. <laughs> Stick up, <laughs> Stick, <Thanks. laughs> Stick at it, lads. Thanks, Hambini. Yeah, that was very sick. cool. Appreciate that. You've got a Visma Lisa bike thing in the notes here. Can I just start off that this Visma kit? With the, oh, it, is it just me or is that thing just disgusting? What have they done? I mean, it, on paper it's similar. It's yellow and black, but. With the black band and it's too much yellow. I think you're carrying on about nothing. Yeah, kind of just, it's got, looks a lot like the last few things. They're just leaning further into the bees type thing. Okay, maybe it's just me. If I just popped up and it just went, oh, God, it's just no good. Anyway. Who makes it? It's still that uh, AG, AG, AGU. AGU. Yeah. AGU. Yeah. There's another one. There's another one. Have you seen no, an AG, not, AGU no, kit? Not allowed to talk about this. No, Jesse. but see, okay. Yeah. No, but we seriously. <laughs> have you seen anyone in an AGU kit? Not one person. <laughs> not one person. But the I tell you stand. what's going to happen is I will get a hundred DMs from AGU wearers, and they'll all be telling me just like Sportful and just like Pissy. They all got in contact with me, and they were not happy, Jesse. We, how dare we? Say that their kit doesn't exist in Sydney. Well, it doesn't. <laughs> and yeah, it's it was like people saying, yeah, it's in all the bike shops. It's on all. Everyone buys it online. It's just sportful and pissy and those things. Predominantly in Germany and in the Balkans and these countries. So fair play to you. So maybe AG, you were kicking goals in Holland and Belgium, but no, oh, Balkans. <laughs> that's a, that's a like that reference. That's a good. Throwback? <laughs> Not a throwback. It's a part of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so if I wanted to, just quickly, if I wanted to buy AGU kit, all right, if I type AGU kit cycling sale, okay? The Balkans. <laughs> what are we in a James Bond movie? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, that's trash. <laughs> how can that, how can someone legitimately say that that website is anything other than a Shopify website. Like that's basically the NeuroKit friggin' channel. Mm -hmm. How is that in the same ballpark as Rafa and Attica and Map? Like what are you talking about that this stuff's the same? That's not. So there, yeah, so the big, okay, so Europe, it, the, the, the website loaded by default in Euros. I mean, Europe, EU was the default. So. Quick bit of coaching chat. So uh, Alex Dowsett has announced that he's a well, coach. He's starting a coaching company of, of types. There's various different packages that you can do, six different packages going all the way up to sort of 450 pounds a month. Um, interesting from my perspective because I, I sort of have a bit of a struggle when it comes to former pros and the legitimacy that that seems to warrant you in cycling. It doesn't go – it goes beyond cycling for me because it goes into – the branding, the marketing, building bikes and stuff, they all seem to you carry this like former pro thing around with you. So my I suppose my question is, do you think that Alex would be a good coach? Would Oh, there's so much here. I could I could really be here for hours. I could let this one run. And I, I can I just quickly say like Okay. It, I'm using him as an him and his example, but there's like this thousands of these former pros. Yeah, that are now coaches, or, or, because or they not were, even pros. Just yeah. someone was relatively fast, and yeah. then they just I'm a coach. Okay, so it pops up. Um, okay, well let let let's break it down. So I'm just going through the coaching thing here. So it is one to one coaching. So I'm private coaching now. <clears throat> first thing off the bat, he's charged. This might sound weird, but he he's charging enough, which is the first thing, because there are. Look, road cycling coaching for what is a pretty big industry because there's a lot of riders that have coaches is on a, from a business point of view, from a professional point of view, is a bit of a dumpster fire. There's all kinds of stuff. So the first thing I like to see is that a coach is charging enough. 
because there are quite a few coaches that come in, and if they're charging, you know, if they're charging sub one hundred and fifty US dollars a month to make that a sustainable career, out of university or if you've finished racing or whatever, as a career as an adult, when you're thirty, when you're fifty. It's very difficult to do if you're still charging people a hundred bucks a month. I mean, yeah, I it's, not, it's not. So I just like to see people charging a decent amount because it means that, well, then you're earning decent money, so you're more likely to stick around as it, and view it as a career. Mm-hmm. You then get with better, you, you become a better coach, and then you stick around. You don't go and get some random corporate job like most <laughs> other coaches do. So I just like to see that off the bat that he's charging a decent amount. Um. He's been an ex-pro. Now, as far as I'm aware, he doesn't have any sort of sports science degree or, or science uh, undergrad. Um, but he has a big experience being coached and as a professional athlete. So he's been through Team GB. Then he's been through World Tour teams. So he's – Alex would have had at least 10 coaches over his career, more likely more. Some of them are probably good. Based on the stories he's told, some of them are probably quite bad. So he, in terms of experience, that's a lot of knowledge to draw on. Um, so that's valuable, having that. He was also, what he's got going for him, he wasn't just a super talented rider who kind of got through. He was obviously relatively talented, but it sounds like from his career, he always had to work quite hard and try different things so he would have learned a lot along the way. So I do think that has value. The, the, I mean, the only thing that would be, that gives you, the only thing is that gives you one aspect, the experience. Um, without the sports science background, does he have an ability to pull the good, all the good bits out of that, filter out all the bad bits he would have learned over the decades with here at team gb as a junior who's coaching you they're probably they're probably not that good so has he been able to filter out a lot of that that's what i i'm not sure um but i mean he's miles ahead of if in the coaching industry he's he, he's already miles ahead of plenty of other coaches that have no experience no qualifications so he's 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 ahead there it's kind of interesting what you said about the the professionalism of the cycling coaching industry mm. and that was sort of where I was headed with it because you know is he a good coach I don't know like who do I how, how do I ask this like where's the where's the choice.com or you know some sort of yeah. um, acc- accreditation is not the right word because you can you know ultimately go and get the, the levels and that sort of stuff but but does a level three coach therefore make you better than the level two coach? Well, maybe I, I'm not sure, but yeah, that's 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 a real challenge for that industry is to give it almost give it some legitimacy. It needs a it needs a like a framework, like a governing body or something that actually cert- well, certifies you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, I mean, Oz, but Oz Cycling has a has a, a qualification process, which is is it better than nothing? Not really, I would say, because really anyone can pass it. You've got – it's not – the standards are so low that it really doesn't mean anything if you're qualified by British cycling or Oz cycling. So that exists, but it's not really worth anything. There's got to be majorly talented juniors who have just had a bad coach who never – Fully reached. I mean, whatever that it's happens. It's not that it's got to be. Sports, you can see. But, you see yeah, we can. We know you can. Th- I can name yeah. people if we want. Yeah. But, um, that's the thing, though, with coaches. You don't, unless they're putting information out. You, you're not gonna know really if they're any good or not, even based on who they've coached. It's not really. Um, now, the only thing Alex has. One of the things Alex has going from is he has put out. I mean, he has a YouTube channel. Mm. He's public. So he's public facing. So you, he's chatted about training. So you can kind of get an idea, yep. at least to some level. There, there are a lot of coaches out there where it's they're basically entirely anonymous. Yeah. Um. So he's got that going for him. 
I, I the only thing I guess from a business point of view, which I look at um, a lot of these things, is is this just a, a flash in the pan pop up thing, or is this something he's looking at as a career to do? With, you know, after being pro, is he want, really want to lock into this? Others have done it. Like Tom Danielson runs a, a coaching business. Um, there's other pros out there that do it and they stick with it, which I like. Um, so yeah, we'll yet to be seen with this. I just don't really like the ones if they if they pop up and then they just they're doing it a bunch six other things, and then it just disappears. Just back to this new bike thing. I just don't understand you, Chris. Okay. <laughs> You had the factor. You posted about the factor or photos with the factor, then got annoyed that people were messaging messaging you about the factor, asking if it was any good. Now you got Cervelo, which, okay, they're letting you ride the frame, so they're giving you a bit of a hand. But now it's kind of a Groundhog Day. Now people are asking you about the Cervelo. Why do you, what's the deal here? Isn't this just the same thing over again? <laughs> you called me out, Jesse. Yes. Uh, so you, you, the I put a photo up on Instagram. Yeah, it's it's funny because so my I hadn't thought about it like that, but when I got sent that picture by Keish after they built the bike, and I thought it's like this dorky picture. It's like normally you see like new bike day pictures. It's the bike in this this beautiful surrounding. And I just sort of saw, saw this photo and I was dressed like a dorky dad and I was standing next to this super bike and I thought it was kind of funny. And so I put that up. But then the reaction, so there's two reactions. So there's our audience, mm-hmm. which is amazing, which is like this, it's like <laughs> everyone's just taking the piss out of me with in-jokes from the show that have been going on for the last 18 months. So ref, who it's like... Who can reference the most um, historical in joke that we've had on the show? Is like an Instagram comment somewhere down the somewhere down the line, you know, okay. holding its speed, all this kind of stuff. So it's just sort of kind of funny. But clearly, it, it then sort of those sort of posts go out of those bubbles and they go into the new bike day bubbles. And so then oh, you yeah. get the people with you know fire emojis and and all this kind of stuff, and it's a bit embarrassing. Like it actually is. I, I actually ultimately was kind of embarrassed by that. Yeah. Not not our audience, which is just, yeah, it's just so funny. It's brilliant. Out of curiosity, if you went and bought this at a local bike shop, what's this retailing for, this setup? Ooh, you would not be coming away with much change from 17, 18,000 Australian dollars, I reckon. Okay. So this is where I... I find it interesting that well, mainly that you posted the f- the photo. R- really, like, I want to know how you feel because you are now an ambassador for an eighteen thousand dollar bike, which already has the most successful world to a team riding it. How do you sleep at night, you degenerate shill? <laughs> uh, it's embarrassing. <laughs> Yeah, it actually is. No, you, you, you. I, I was embarrassed by. It. I, I, I would not have posted. Okay. No, I, I do feel that way. Actually, um, I shouldn't. I don't feel like I should have. I, it's not just that picture. Like we get on here and we talk about it and we, we take shit apart. I feel like I feel more comfortable doing that with an eighteen thousand. I could do that with a forty thousand dollar bike. I don't care. We can, we can go into the nuances of, of it. But you're dead right. Like buying into the, the frothy. Instagram froth, <laughs> it's, it's a shit look. I agree. And the photo, that particular photo, which I thought was just like funny, like he's a dork standing next to a shit hot bike. But, but yeah, I, I, and I, I, I've, well, I just broke the table. I'm totally jealous of you in this. I said this the other day. <laughs> you have this, oh, I don't want, I don't care. No, nah, just going to and, and ride my old bike. And you, a little part of you, it's okay. A lot of it's just you can't be bothered, whatever. But a little part of you is is doing it because you feel that there is a consumerism to all this that is disgusting. Like it is, it isn't. It's bad for humans. It's bad for the environment. It's it's all that kind of stuff. 
And I'm very jealous of your attitude in that. And when you call me out on it, and I remember you called me after I put that photo up, I was like, ah, oh, shit, he's probably I was right. surprised you posted the yeah. photo. I'm like, wow, suddenly mm. Chris is the S5 guy. Look yeah. at him go. <laughs> no, um, no I, I, you're dead right. And Especially because it's not like they paid you. I'd feel way more comfortable if they did pay me. Yeah. And I'd be they, like, yep, here it is. If you just, Happy it's days. It's just my job. Yep. And I just got paid to do it. Yep. And, yeah, they I, put up the most cash and go for it. I mean, Peak Talk and Joe, when they were talking about the show, they were like, Jesse just calls it as it is, and Chris is like obsessed with brands and gets over the top. Hey, he's totally just called me out, and <laughs> I've just lived up to that, you know. <laughs> so he's got that dynamic dead right. Shout, Peak, Merry Christmas! But I will say just to finish this off. Oh, it is the, cool to ride an S five though. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that made me feel made me feel one one thing that sort of tempered that again is this like the piss take of our audience in those comments just ripping me made me feel much better about the whole thing that our audience are on, in in on the joke as opposed to that it wasn't just flame emojis yeah. oh yeah it's like oh, i can't wait to <laughs> can't wait to see how that holds its speed. like that that audience like i just love that like keep taking the piss out of me every time i post something about it all right, Jesse, I think that's us done this week. Do you want to mention anything about a potential guest show coming up? Do you want to give any insight into that? Do we want to? I think you should. I think Do a little want teaser to? is all right. I think this is um, – it was, it was a – we won't spoil too much. You're going to have a bit of work to do in the edit because the, the guest we had that we already recorded but will be coming up, uh, English was his, was his first language and was – Quite technical, we will say. So we'll take a bit of editing and sort of cleaning up to get things to flow well. Just be Crystal do his magic. Jesus. Yeah. Chris will right. Right. Crystal do his magic. Um, but I, I am I'm just excited for this guest, particularly because it helps push back against one of the main strings of criticism that the show gets, which is that you don't know what you're talking about and you always get things wrong, blah, blah, blah. So we have a guest on that contributes to the space for the all the all the peak talk people that watch us that are into your technological measurements and your analytics and things. You're going to enjoy the next guest. So we are yeah, doing something in that space too. It's not all just banter and shit talk. I'm excited. Yeah, I am too. I'm excited. All right. Well, uh, until and then, then, and then, so the week, so that'll be next week when we do our regular show. I've got so much to get into based on the guest episode that's coming up. So this is now going to span about three three weeks of stuff because there's a whole bunch to get into. Alrighty, until then, see you next week. Alfie de Zen. <laughs>